but there's also a criminal element. And we, our Safer Cities was very successful downtown, and then we had to pretty much get hogtied and hand-tied because of a lawsuit that wouldn't let us deal with the criminal element of homelessness. We still got a lot of work to do, um, but I think things are getting a little better. We're certainly providing more housing, but we, we've got a lot of work to do. In this budget, with one-time money, we're, we were able to leverage state money, because one-time money should only be used for one-time use, not for ongoing things. You all know that. So we're using it to provide housing that the county will then provide services so we can get out of the lawsuit. That will at least allow us to do feel better and smarter with the criminal element. We'll still have to identify more resources for the housing services for the non-criminal element. Okay, and I think I'm going to have to apologize, but this will be the last no, one. No, I need no. to get my we, boss no, to... No, no, no. We, we, we got... We, you we got, got... Okay, then. One more question. No, we got a few more. Thank you very much, Mayor Barragosa. I want to say, first of all, thank you for your courage and your commitment. Very impressive, and I'm very grateful. I'm with the North Hollywood and Northeast Neighborhood Council, and I do like to try to perceive myself as being part of the solution. And there's one little problem that maybe you can help sure. before before the end of, of the year. <laughs> We're working all day to the last day. <laughs> okay. One of the problems that I see is that I can go driving down almost any major street in the middle of the day, and there are street lights that are still illuminated. I would like to see some of us uh, uh, reach into that technologies, the technology that we have developed and have on a switchboard somewhere in front of somebody who's watching the screen there's a street light on. Let's push a button and turn it off. You know, it's interesting that you say that because I, I go work out sometimes <laughs> like uh, 5.45 in the morning. I do Pilates, so I go to a little place and I go do my workout. And um, actually here, <coughs> with the time change, with the time change, the lights are turned off still and they should be on on a section of the road. So I called about that. I am going to get me the streets where they're on and they should be off, and then we'll have them look at them, because it's a pet peeve for mine. The other one's even more serious for me, because you can get in a car accident when all these lights are off, and well, we almost, you know, you know people, I, I love when people walk in the middle of the street when it's dark, and they're wearing dark clothing, and you know, they're not looking to see if a car's coming, you know, like we almost, bumped into somebody because the lights were out and so we'll look at that. Give me the streets. Okay. And if you get the streets to Yolanda, we'll, we'll follow up on it. Yes. Buenas tardes, Mayor. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Jose Castillo. Uh, I came here in 1980 from Texas and I've lived here in 1980. I've been here through the riots. I've been here through the Olympics. I've been through the good times and the bad times. I'm a graduate of Pepperdine University as well as USC. I went to the entrepreneurial program. And I've owned a business, I'm a real estate broker. So I deal with affordable housing, I deal with foreclosures, I deal with all the scams that, that are happening in the Hispanic community. My question to you is dealing with not only affordable housing, but I wanted to talk to you about something that's really more important to me. And it's important because it's so important that I brought a student from Pepperdine University, who's here next to me. She's a student from China, going through the master's program, and wants to be able to get a job from a master's program in a company that's situated here in Los Angeles, and she's not able to do that. And where do you stand on the issue of immigration reform, and how are you going to be able to help the community get that across the, across the line? You know, it's interesting because I also was, as I told you, I was born here. I, I lived here my whole life. I grew up in an English-speaking home. Uh, I did not grow up with an immigrant experience, because my father was an immigrant, but he left when I was five, and I didn't really have a relationship with him, so, I, you know, I, I didn't grow up with that experience, but I did live in a community where there were a lot of immigrants, and probably back then, uh, a lot of undocumented, and, you know, I saw them work, and I saw how hard many of them worked, and I saw them raising their families, and 
this is an area where, you know, over the years, uh, I've always voted my conscience. I know a lot of people uh, from time to time have disagreed on this issue. Increasingly, I think, and I was at the Jewish Federation uh, yesterday speaking on this issue, I think more and more, LA, California, every poll I've seen, people are realizing you can't deport 11 million people. It's never going to happen. No country's ever done it. Many of these kids have lived here their whole lives. You know, they don't know any other country. We've got to figure it out. Uh, nobody wants it to be automatic. It ought to be earned. You ought to get it at the end of the line. You ought to pay back your back taxes. You shouldn't be uh, have committed serious crimes. You, 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 you ought to be able to show that you're working. But in the end, I think more and more uh, people have come around to the notion that, you know, particularly in this town, I mean, one out of ten people, one out of ten people is undocumented in L.A. How about this? 42% foreign-born, 42% foreign-born, 57% of the city, 57 have at least one immigrant as a head of household. 57. And by the way, they come from 140 countries, they speak 220 languages. They're not all from one country, Mexico, you know, they're, they're not all Latino. Um, only, only about, in this town, about 70%, uh, you know, uh, are Latino. 30% are from a lot of other countries. They're Canadian, they're Brits, they're Aussies, they're a lot of different countries, but they're primarily from that part of the world. So I, I support comprehensive immigration reform. I've spoken on it, but I tell people, it's an economic issue for us. Let me tell you something. I can't tell you the number of graduations I go to and I meet these kids and they're valedictorians and they're graduating at the top of their class. They're undocumented. So they don't want to go to college because they're afraid they'll never get a job. So one of the things the economists have uh, demonstrated is that if you bring these people from out of the dark and into the light, they're going to spend one point. They're going to contribute 1.5 trillion dollars to the U.S. economy, disproportionately to L.A. because a lot of them live here and, and in California. And more importantly, in a social security system that's going to go bankrupt in 30 years, they're going to be paying into it because they're younger, and if they're educated, they're paying more. So this is good for everybody. But you've got to secure the borders. Uh, that's what people feel and believe strongly that we ought to do. There's Republican and Democrat support in the Senate right now for it. It's, it's tough. It'll be 13 years before any of these people, even if they do all the right things, will become citizens. But it gives them a pathway, it, you know, uh, it, and it provides us with an opportunity to get this behind. <coughs> Ultimately, if people want to deal with future flow, and we have every right to do it, Every country has immigration laws. If you want to deal with future flow, you got to deal with employers and employer sanctions, and you got to have a system, particularly in, in agriculture, you got to have a system where you can bring people to work there, because the vast majority of us, I don't know if you've ever worked in the fields. I haven't, but I pulled weeds in the backyard. You do a day of that, and you're feeling it. You're feeling it like, you know, I've done construction, jackhammer and picking up 100-pound sacks of cement. You know, there's nothing like back-breaking work of, you know, pulling weeds. And I, you know, I've never worked in the fields, but I understand it's even more back-breaking and hotter because most of it's in central California. I, you know what? I was a Boy Scout. Um, and a Boy, Boy Scout... Boy Scout gave me something. They gave me this love for nature. They gave me discipline. And um, we had a guy named Uncle Jack. An Irish Navy drill sergeant. <laughs> who, 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 we were the first troop that was, you know, Mexican troop, Mexican-American troop. And this was in the early 60s. And he'd say to us, you know, you're the first. So you guys have to be cleaner you have to be more disciplined. And he'd have us, he'd have us sweep the campsite. He'd have us clean 
the pots and pans so that you could just almost see yourself in them. So I've always been a little boy scout. So what's your name, sir? Hi, my name is Brian Alvarez, and um, I go to Panorama High School, like right here. What? Uh, right? School. Uh, anyway, um, during my experience in high school, I'm only a freshman, but um, some of the teachers have been um, very, um, they, they've been very um, uncomfortable with the students because those students are like, they're turning out to be more disrespectful to the teachers, more violent in the classrooms, and um, most of them, they, they, uh, the teachers don't want them to be nine R's or to be high school dropouts. And um, some people told me, like, what's, the, what's up with the students? But my question is, what are you going to do? Like, how are you going to solve the high school dropouts? What, what could, is your solution about that? You know, I think we got to challenge our kids. One of the things that I've argued is that parents have to be more accountable. I mean, some of you know my story. My mom rode the bus the whole life. I went to Catholic school in Ramona Gardens in the projects, in Dolores Mission and the other projects. My mother used to go to parent school, parent teacher nights, to back to school nights. She'd come and visit my classroom and she had to take the bus and walk into the projects. She was a single mom. She knew she had a responsibility. She had three, three, four kids. She had to take care of them. So I tell people, parents have to be accountable. <coughs> they have to be responsible. They have rights, roles, and responsibilities. Teachers have to be responsible and accountable. They got a job. And they can't say, oh, well, you don't understand. Those kids are poor. Their parents don't speak English. Their parents didn't go to education. Get, get, go to get a college education. A lot of us have parents like that. And we learn to read, so you can't make excuses. You've got to be accountable. Then, principal. You know, a lot of principals, one of the ways we're improving the schools is a lot of principals, they're great at the operation because they're running little cities, right? 3,000 kids in a high school. They're running cities. They're great at running the city. But they never go in the classroom. The number one job of a principal is an instructional leader. So they got to be in the classroom supporting the teacher and being responsible and accountable. Four, students. You said respect. Hey, you know what? Students have a responsibility. You go to learn. You got to be respectful. It's very important that everybody understands their rights, their roles, and their responsibilities. So, how do you improve the? The, the, the graduation rate, the dropout rate, rigorous curriculum, high expectations. Um, you have to have <coughs> metrics, data, that you're constantly evaluating to see how your kids are doing, how the teacher's doing, and how the school's doing. That's how the partnership school is done. If you come to my schools in Watts, I have three schools at 750. One is 790, one is about 760 something, and the other 750 something. Three schools in Watts at 750. On the threshold of being at 800, you go in those schools, you see data, the kids work, data and expectations on all the walls. You go in through, you go in the halls, you see data. So you don't lose kids. Every kid knows where they are. We started the school report card. If kids get a school, get a report card, what about a school? Now we want, that school report card's gone district-wide. I want to get a, a report card for every school with a grade on it that says how many your kids are graduating, how many kids are scoring where on the, you know, on the high school exit exam, on the, on the academic performance index. That's how you do it. And you got to be committed to it. We can't keep on losing our kids. The city and the school district are net right now. We put in money, they put in money, and we're doing a thing called student recovery. We identify all the kids that are dropping out, and we knock on their door <coughs> and talk to their parents and say, "Come back to school." And guess what? Sometimes their parents in the toughest neighborhoods 
when they answer the door, guess who's at the door? The mayor. <laughs> <laughs> and they bring out the camera and they want to take a picture, and I take a picture with them. And then you know what I say? Man, what's going on? Your son here? He hasn't been to school in 75 days. Or 60 days or four years. He's dropped out. He didn't come all year round. See? Every kid's got a matter. We've got to figure it out. You all know my story. I was a high school dropout. I was kicked out of school before that. But I had a great teacher, Herman Katz, who lives in the San Fernando Valley, by the way. Still my friend. Still my mentor. And my mom, who, you know, made sure I went back. So I'll take one more. And then, uh, yes. Oh, oh not fair. 14 years perfect attendance? Yes, I'm sorry, you have one. I'm okay. talking about that. So 14 perfect years attendance. Perfect. Yeah, by the way, that's the other thing I always tell kids. <coughs> Half of the game is showing up. Isn't that right? Showing up. If, if you don't take the exam, one thing's for sure. You have failed it. That's the one thing. Now, you might not get an A if you show up, but showing up is important. So in all my schools, one of the things we measure... What's our attendance rate? We want to see our attendance rate because on average, <coughs> if you're missed 10 days a year, I think it's more than 10 days a year, you're more likely to fail that year than not. You just are. 20 days, God forbid. Showing up is important. Yes, ma'am, the last one. My name is Jeanette Hopp. I have been a Van Nuys resident for 37 years. I was a parent advocate for Early Unified for 26 years. I am an inspector for the city and the county and have done so for 26 years as well. And I too am a Van Nuys Neighborhood Council member and officer on the treasurer. And I have two concerns, one of which was the fact that uh, we have a big disconnect between the Valley and LA. And I'm not for cessation, let me preface my statement by letting you know that my question. But at the same time, we do have that disconnect. The video conferencing was discontinued. I realized there wasn't a huge turnout much of the time, but there wasn't enough notice on what was going to be discussed either. But because of that disconnect, we don't get a lot of our needs met, and you know that that kind of upsets people, like the streets being redone and the crime problem being addressed and so on. The other thing I have a major concern with is something that the young man touched upon, education. And obviously because LA Unified is the second largest school district in the nation, and has a big problem with the budget and has a major problem with dropout and grades and so on. Um, my concern is twofold. One, we have a teacher problem and administrator problem with uh, kids being abused and the teachers being allowed to be on administrative leave but being paid because of UTLA and their, their stronghold. So what can you do to help prevent that from happening in the future because the Sunshine Committee was gone, is gone. And what can you do about vocational ed? Because vocational education is important. important. Many kids cannot go to college and they need help in other areas. Thank you. You know, some of you remember, I was married to a teacher for 21 years, I, I, uh, 20 years rather. I, I saw how hard, how dedicated she was. She had a master's. She'd work into the night after cooking, taking care of the kids and put them in the bed. Teaching is a tough job. And the vast majority of teachers go in not to get rich. They go in because they want to make a difference. So I'm not a teacher basher by any stretch. Many of you know I worked for the teachers union for eight years. Um, you also you also may know you also may know that even though I did work for them and they spent one point eight, I don't know, one half million dollars to get me elected. I've been taking them on. And not because I'm against them, but I challenge. I challenge a couple things. Every time we've tried to make some reforms, not the teachers themselves, but the, but the union's kind of been trying to stop us. And we're saying, hold it, everybody. We've got to put the interests of kids first. We can't keep on saying no to every effort to change things. 48% graduation rate is unacceptable. And the notion that it's because they're all poor, come on, we were poor. 
A lot of us were poor. A lot of us, you know, I was the first to go to college in my family. I, I can read and write. You know, they can read and write too. So, that's what these school board battles have been about, frankly. That we're saying, we want people who are willing to look at things fresh. Willing to change things if they're not working. Willing to hold everybody accountable. Not just the teachers and the, the principals, but the, the politicians, the, the, the parents and the students. All of us, we're all in this together. So you just said something. You all remember Miramonte. Sexual abuse case. Do you know we had to pay this person 40? He was in jail. Going to stay in jail for a very long time. I hope forever. We had to pay him $40,000 because we couldn't fire him. Because the law makes it almost impossible to dismiss a teacher. I mean, come on, everybody. That's, that's not. And we tried to change it. I went to Sacramento. I pushed for that bill. And again, whether you're a cop, a priest, a boy, police officer, a priest, or a politician, nobody's above the law. We ought to make it. You know, when people make mistakes, you got to give them a second chance. But when they do things like that, you know, come on. There's not a second chance for that. It's, it's, it's over. And you ought to leave with some dignity and say, I, I did this horrible thing. And not, we had to pay him $40,000. And I was so outraged by it, we went to Sacramento. So there's, there's things we've got to change. On the city valley thing, I'll just say this. I'm glad you're not for secession because we're, we're stronger together and things have gotten better, but things have to get better still. And one of the reasons why, even in the worst recession, when a lot of people thought I would eliminate funding for the neighborhood councils, I didn't. And the reason why I didn't is because I really do believe we've got to bring government closer to people. Now, let's be honest. Some neighborhood council meetings, eight people show up. We invited, I think we had 300 and some odd B, uh, Over RSVPs and about 100 came. I mean, people are busy. But we ought to at least make the effort to reach out to people. When you reach out to them, they're not always going to agree with you. They're not always going to be happy. But they'll feel like you care. And on that note, I just want to say... We have one last question, though, and I'll ask everybody's questions. What's next for our great Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, look, I, I, I'll tell you something. You know, I'm a different person than the person who got elected eight years ago. You know, you go through a crisis, you learn a lot of things. I never was mayor before. I was speaker of the assembly, a big, giant job. You know, I was a council member for two years. I'm not sure you're ever really, you know prepared to do something of this magnitude. Um, over the years, I've come to realize, you know why people are so disaffected from government <coughs> right now? All government. They're probably a little more effect, you know, connected to local government, but the federal government, the state government, is that it's broken on the right and it's broken on the left. I tell people it's easy to say no to your enemies or your opponents, because I don't have enemies, but your opponents. I don't, you know, I, don't, I don't consider them my enemies. Even when in the biggest battles in the two mayor's races, I had a great deal of respect for Jim Hunt. You know, I, he wanted the job like I wanted the job, and we both, you know, you know, we both fought hard, but I, I respected him. So he's an opponent, not an enemy. And the same with, you know, it's easy to take on your opponents, the people who've never been with you, the people who don't like you, it's a lot harder to take on your friends. That's harder. The people who supported you, you're all like, so what you see on both sides, they can't say no to the interests that support them. So I think it's broken on the right and it's broken on the left. I think one of the things I want to do is I want to affiliate with a university, maybe UCLA, maybe SC, a think tank to see how we fix UCLA. 
I went to UCLA. <laughs> to see how we fix how we fix the broken system, particularly here in the state. That's one thing. I'll probably do a lot of public speaking. I, I get a lot of requests to speak around the world, but I say no most of the time. I know the papers say that I go all the time, but but you know I say trust me, ask them. I say no most of the time, and then you know I. Don't have a house, don't have a job, don't have a car, so I, I'm going to have to go work. Uh, <laughs> and, and I like to work. I, told, I, I tell people, you know, I like to work. So I would say this, I have no idea what I'm going to do. I, other than those areas that I just mentioned. I know this. I know that I love to work. You know how some people walk in and say, how are you doing? They'll say, oh, it's Monday. <laughs> <laughs> and then you'll see the other ones and I say, how are you doing? And say, oh, it's Friday. I'm not one of those people. I love to go to work. I just, you know, since I was a kid, you know, when a shiny shoes downtown. So I, I expect I'm going to work a lot. Um, I, I expect I'll probably be on a plane. Uh, I live here, of course. This will always be the base of operations. But I, I expect that I'll, I'll, I'll be around. And then, you know, I've made it clear, I, I'm 